Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, the, our, the latest installment of uh, the Let's Talk series uh, from the Bedford Playhouse Virtual Playhouse. Uh, my name is Dan. I am the Director of Development and Programming, and we're very pleased that you're taking some time out of your schedule to spend it with us uh, this evening for uh, what's going to be a very important conversation. Um, a couple of things that I just want to mention before we start. Uh, is that uh, there is a Q&A button, which you should all be able to find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you are on a laptop or PC, there's also, uh, if you're on a phone or iPad, I think it's at the top of your screen on Zoom. Um, please, uh, at any point, if you'd like to post a question, um, do so. The moderators will get to as many of them as that we possibly can in the time that we have. Uh, please try to refrain from using the chat feature uh, the chat tends to confuse a few things um, with regard to the Q&A. So please post all your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we have some good news that the Bedford Playhouse is no longer completely virtual. Uh, per the, uh, the governor's uh, 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 permission, we have reopened as of this past Friday uh, with limited capacity and observing all of the necessary safety protocols uh, for social distancing. So uh, please check out our website. We are starting uh, some live programming back up. Um, if you are comfortable and if you're so inclined, uh, you may find something on there that uh, appeals to you. Uh, and I would also just ask for those of you who enjoy these types of programs, um, if you would um, uh, uh, consider, uh, oops, consider uh, making a donation to the Playhouse. Uh, you can do so also on our website before you shut your devices down tonight. Uh, if you would be so inclined to do that, that'd be great. Um, I would like to now introduce our moderators for the evening. Uh, so please welcome uh, Angela Alvarado and Tamara Tribble. We're going to take you the rest of the way. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Angela Alvarado and I'm the student assist counselor at Fox Lane High School. I'm a licensed social worker and this is my counterpart. Hello, my name is Tamara Tribble and I am the student assistance counselor at Fox Lane Middle School. We work with the student assistance program and we specialize in alcohol and substance misuse prevention and early intervention for the middle school and high school students and their families in Westchester County. We we have the pleasure this evening to collaborate with three of our community doctors from Silver Hill Hospital. Tonight is about coming together as a community and learning about how we can help our teenagers to make healthy decisions. We will be discussing how vaping, marijuana and alcohol ha has had an impact on our youth and, we, um, and, we can, and what we can do to prevent it. We're hoping that this evening you will walk away with information on what we can do, all do to help our youth make healthy decisions so that we can move forward on a path to help them feel successful. We wanna um, also take a moment to just thank those who made tonight happen. The Let's Talk effort um, was conceived in 2019 by Christine Biddle and Vanessa Smith and Audrey Zinman who proposed this establishing a community conversation to start addressing mental health and substance use disorders. Um, so they're, you know, they were hoping and what they are doing tonight is bringing in leading experts to share their resources and information so we can have encouraging conversations on how to um, end the isolation and stigma associated with mental health and substance use disorders. The Befford Playhouse, as you know, um, joined in this conversation and they established the Let's Talk series, um, which has consisted of films and panel discussions by our leading experts and shared resources, recognizing that healing begins with sharing experiences, honest conversations, and leading edge knowledge. The Bedford Lewisboro Pound Ridge Drug Abuse Prevention Council, also known as the DAPC, joined forces with the Less Talk in 2020 to forward the shared missions. And the DAPC is a three town cooperative effort that works to implement science based prevention strategies that focuses on increasing protective factors and decreasing risk factors associated with alcohol, drug abuse in individual families and communities. Thank you so much for um, making tonight happen and we look forward to future events on helping individual families and our community. I'm gonna turn it over now to Tamara Triple to introduce our panel of experts. 
Hello, and to second everything that Angela has said, we are really grateful to have um, you all here with us tonight and grateful for our guest speakers um, as we continue to learn about substance misuse and to shed some light on what trends they are seeing firsthand as professionals in the field. Um, so to start, Dr. Frank Bartolomeo is the Director of Adolescent Services at Silver Hill Hospital. He oversees inpatient transitional living and intensive outpatient program for adolescents, as well as the design and implementation of new and innovative clinical programs and services. Dr. Bartolo Mateo believes that increasing resilience means having the capacity to bounce back from adversity through the support of meaningful relationships with friends, families, or community. This has been a guiding principle for him over the course of his 30 year career working with 13 to 18 year olds, as well as emerging adults. Our next speaker is Dr. Rocco Murado. He is the service chief for the Adult Transitional Living Program at Silver Hill Hospital. He heads up the extended stay hospital-based highly structured program for adult patients from all across the hospital centers of expertise. To Dr. Matolo, healing people is a mission, a vocation and a calling. He says, the mission of healing has been paramount within the hospital's institutional culture for generations and scrumptiously passed down. He and his team have had strong resolve to never give up and uses every means possible to help patients and their families. And last but not least, we have Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz Schwartz, who is the service chief of the Adolescent Transitional Living Program at Silver Hill Hospital. She and her team treat patients with multiple psychiatric diagnoses, borderline personality disorders, reactive attachment disorders, mood disorders, such as depression, anxiety, and bipolar illness, and co-occurring disorders. She strives to give adolescents and their families the tools to manage challenging behaviors, regulate emotions, better understand their difficulties, and improve their communication in order to set out on a different course. Dr. Ortiz Schwartz believes in going the extra mile to understand where her patients are coming from. So thank you for all being here. At this time, we will view a 15 minute video that was put together from our panelists and it will be speaking about vaping, marijuana and alcohol. Again, please use this time if you have any questions to direct your questions into the Q and A tab, not the chat room. We will get to as many questions as we can. After the video is done, um, be mindful that this is will be recorded. So if you miss something, you will have the opportunity to watch this again when we send you the recording. Once the video is complete, we will begin right away with our Q&A portion. And now we're getting ready to watch the video. Today I want to talk about vaping, nicotine addiction, um, and it's a really important subject because um, of the high number of people who are using it at younger ages and what problems it causes. Uh, very few people start using nicotine thinking about future consequences. It is only once they're addicted to it that they recognize the drawbacks of their decision. Uh, nicotine is one of the most addictive substances in the brain, more addictive than heroin. And what it does in terms of withdrawal, in terms of increase of anxiety, cravings, uh, the need to obtain the substance to maintain that uh, feeling of normalcy, uh, and the need to continue using in spite of uh, all the consequences can lead to, to serious problems. Uh, nicotine can get into the system in a variety of ways, um, cigarette smoke. Uh, is you know extremely deadly. About one uh, out of two people uh, who smoke in their lifetime will die of related illnesses, cancer, lung diseases, etc. For most people, that is that is a given, and that's a very well well learned, um, well piece of well known piece of information. Um, but vaping is something that is uh, is considerably of concern because since vape started. Uh, being produced and massively uh, used in, in 2011, um, you know, people felt that this was not a big concern. So the, the availability 
and the feeling that these are not harmful substances has created a false sense of it is okay to, to use. So in vaping, there's water vapor uh, that in and of itself is not carcinogenic, but there are additional toxins, including the metal coils in e-cigarettes that can also release uh, substances that are possible toxins to the, to the brain um, and to the body. There are oils and scents, and these are poorly regulated um, industries. Um, in, 2000, in 2019, there were multiple pulmonary uh, emergency admissions and deaths uh, that, you know, for individuals, uh, even very young ones who needed oxygen therapy, um, and uh, that was related to um, you know, to vaping, primarily things that were modified and, and contained vitamin E acetate, which was, uh, you know, particularly toxic to the lungs. It's something that we can ingest, um, and it's in, in popcorn and other uh, oils uh, that are mass produced. But when they, these things are absorbed into the lung, they can create significant problems and numbers of, of people were affected, hospitalized, and, and, and uh, you know, ended up with significant um, problems related to that. So that is a concern. Um, in terms of other, um, you know, is issues beyond the health uh, aspects, which is that a lot of younger people are using, you see it more often uh, than not, and people would have never used athletes um, and students as early as in the area have encountered kids in third grade that are already experimenting with, with vaping. Um, so it, it is a concern. Uh, financially, there is an aspect where people will spend, you know, $1,000 or more a year just to maintain the habit. Um, and there are concerns in terms of hygiene, in terms of sharing vape pens and, um, and other paraphernalia in terms of how uh, transmitting other things like, like herpes and mononucleosis and potentially now uh, COVID is something that just to share, sharing these devices can be uh, problematic. So um, yes, uh, I think that the, the fact that these substances are not, are poorly regulated, that we do not know what beyond the nicotine, um, other chemicals that are being absorbed into the lungs, the nicotine itself can be problematic to the brain and that there are a lot of other health, economic um, impacts uh, and social impacts to using, it's really important to consider whether it is a, a wise and safe um, decision. Some of the lung damage that we're seeing in people that are smoking uh, vapes for even a couple of years are similar to some of the lung damages that you see with people when people are smoking for a longer period of time. Um, you know, because again, vapes have been around for a shorter period of time, but we can recognize that they can cause more, um, more problems quickly. I was asked to speak uh, this evening on the effects of cannabis on the behavior and well-being of young people. When I was younger, I worked mostly in the city, and what we saw was really agitated people, young people ages 16 to, to 21. And... At first, it was the, the cocaine uh, seemed to be uh, a really powerful thing. We didn't think so much about the marijuana as being part of the problem. But as the years went by, it seemed to me that the use of marijuana was a very potent, very powerful effect on young people. And not on everybody by a long shot, but there seemed to be a subgroup, especially of young people, uh, men who were particularly vulnerable to smoking marijuana. And it seemed odd to me at first, since my generation had, would smoke and we didn't see big problems or we didn't think we did. And those of us working with young people began to notice something else. And um, there's not a lot of data on it, but this is my experience, which is that very often privileged and highly intelligent young people, really, really bright young people would be admitted with psychotic disorders, which were also resistant to conventional treatment. And interestingly, um, when you did, you know, cognitive testing on them, they were intact at the same time they were incapable of functioning reasonably. 
and that this would continue even after they stopped using marijuana. And over time, we had to develop uh, new techniques of uh, dealing with them. Um, and so you have to say, well, is it everybody who smokes marijuana who has this problem? And no, it's not at all. There are, there are people who are vulnerable and people who aren't. So in my own mind, the vulnerability seems to be much more so in boys, but it might be that boys use drugs more and take greater risks than girls do. So that it might be a matter of dose. I mean, one thing that's changed over the years is that marijuana is now much more potent uh, than it used to be years ago. Uh, it may be four to five times more potent. And there may be a threshold for it doing damage. Um, and so there may be a crossing point where if you're exposed to it for an extended period of time, uh, you have more risk of having problems. So that that's a kind of th important thing. It also could be there are some people who just because of their family background and the family history are more vulnerable. So it might make sense that if you came from a family where there was schizophrenic illness, that you'd be more likely to show schizophrenia using drugs. And maybe it's simply, simply that if you were using marijuana, it would come on earlier than before. Though that doesn't necessarily seem to be true from the data. But it could be something like, say, if you had a family where there was a history of depression or bipolar illness, that the use of cannabis might make you much more prone to develop something that looked closer to a schizophrenia that would be called technically a schizoaffective disorder of some kind. And again, that's my suspicion uh, to what we're seeing. There are 33 states and I think Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia uh, that allow, you know, the use of marijuana uh, for medicinal purposes. And what I see is many, many people now who are being treated with marijuana for anxiety disorder and other issues, and which also leads to the general acceptance. And it's a mismatch between federal law, which makes marijuana a you know, class one controlled substance in the states which make it generally available. Um, and what's sold in most states is not regulated. You don't actually know what's in it, which is another interesting uh, phenomenon. So I've given you my, my plea that people should be more careful, that my experience as a physician is that it can be relatively dangerous and that we see you know, in this country, a fairly high degree of morbidity that can be ascribed to the use of marijuana and cocaine and alcohol, and we're maybe not focused on it in the way we should be, uh, to, to, and that is to the detriment of our children. You know, so underage drinking, particularly, you know, binge drinking is uh, a serious public health problem in the United States. For adolescents, they consume uh, more than 90% of uh, their alcohol by binge drinking. So nine out of 10 adults who suffer from uh, addiction to uh, nicotine, uh, alcohol, or other drugs, you know, began using before the age of 18. You know, about half of all American high school students are using addictive substances. So binge drinking uh, is really, for males, five or more drinks in a two-hour period. The consequences of underage drinking, heightened risk for addiction, accidents, injuries, and death. So the fatalities uh, from uh, automobile accidents, uh, alcohol poisoning, we hear that happening uh, with hazing, and um, there are about 190,000 visits to emergency rooms that are uh, alcohol-related, uh, and those are related to falls, they're related to um, particularly, you know, aggressive, aggressive behavior. A lot of male-on-male -male, uh, violence um, involves alcohol. Um, and there's an increased risk of, of um, you know, being victimized when, when alcohol is involved. Uh, it can also contribute to, um, you know, mental health conditions uh, like depression and anxiety. In some cases, there was a pre-existing, for example, depression um, and then someone began to uh, drink alcohol in parts of this called the self-medication hypothesis. 
uh, begin to drink to sort of feel better, but can also work in reverse. Uh, you can um, be using a substance that's having an effect on the central nervous system that can lead to the development of uh, a mental health disorder um, like, uh, like depression. You know, we know that alcohol affects the adolescent brain uh, differently than it does adults. You know, because the adolescent brain is in a state of, of growth, uh, it's impacting, um, you know, particularly the development of the, the, you know, frontal lobes and the prefrontal cortex. And it has an effect on, um, on learning. So people probably heard of all, all of this information about you know, the, the, the neuroscience of the adolescent brain. And what we know now, uh, based on uh, increased technology, is that our brain goes through different periods of, of, of growth and change. And the highest amount is from you know, birth to you know, really three years. And then it goes through another period of what we call plasticity. Um, uh, reaching a height of at 15 years. And what plasticity refers to is really that our brains can change uh, in response to um, environment and in response to um, kind of what we're putting into our bodies. So adolescence has been described as both a period of, of, of opportunity and risk. Uh, so I often compare it to being able to open up, you know, a window and you can either let fresh air in or uh, you know, if it's smog or other kinds of things, that's getting in too, and that's having an effect really on the um, the development of your brain. Aaron White, who's a, a researcher at at Duke, and he's noticed uh, that there are actually changes and differences in the brains of adolescents who binge drink versus those who don't. He makes the statement that if you're binge drinking, um, you know, in high school and college, it's like a self-induced learning disability. Uh, because your brain is having difficulty forming new memories. And there's a lot of research on, uh, you know, what we call parenting styles and, uh, and the, the effect on children. There's at one end of the continuum, the permissive parent. At the other end of the continuum, I call the drill sergeant parent. And, you know, we have found the most effective parenting style is really kind of the middle, the middle path that incorporates um, uh, elements of both style, of both that there's there's limits, there are limits and boundaries and safety, uh, but it's also done in the atmosphere of love and and warmth and and flexibility. What we're really trying to do uh, in terms of brain health uh, is to give our our adolescents uh, as much time as possible uh, so that their brains can, can mature and evolve in a, in a healthy and the most effective and skillful way and putting in substances, whether it's cannabis, nicotine, uh, and alcohol, which is also a very addictive substance, um, is literally shaping, uh, and affecting, uh, you know, brain development. Okay, thank you. So please direct your questions to the question and answer tab on the bottom of your screen. Okay, so the first question we have, anybody can answer. Are the schizoaffective type conditions you are observing with marijuana use reversible? This is uh, Dr. Murata, can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. we can hear you. Yeah, I mean, um, there's something on my screen. So um, yeah, I, I think often they are, especially the kinds of things I see that I believe are part of the uh, exposure to drugs like marijuana and alcohol and young people. I think some of the things that Frank just said, some of his ideas are, absolutely critical because he's talking about critical periods of growth. And along with the critical periods of growth are periods of enhanced vulnerability. And so when young people are exposed to drugs and when it leads to a 
maybe a misdirection of development and learning, right? There's still time to try to get things back into place. And so they can be reversible, but not necessarily with the kind of conventional treatments that are sometimes spoken about. So there's all, you know, you have to like invent in quotes or develop a prescription for each individual person because, you know, the, the prescription is a recipe, right? What's the recipe that will help that individual? And that takes a lot of intense work. That's just not out of a cookbook, you know? It's not that this is the diagnosis, this is exactly what you do. It has to be thought out carefully for each person. But I'm very hope, hopeful for people, you know? We've seen incredible, incredibly important uh, changes for the good in lots of these kids, lots of them. To add to that, I'd like to say that when we treat adolescents, a lot of the times they come in with such levels of, um, of impairment. And even after a few weeks, um, as they continue to do better, it's still a concern that the fact that they were able to get impaired so much to begin with. And for a lot of kids, that's a, the first beginning of concern that might lead them to, you know, to experience what Dr. Murata sees with the older, young, young, young adult patients in terms of just the first sign of deterioration. Um, so I think it's it's really important to, you know, to, to consider that, that the kids look extremely disturbed and as they start clearing their brain starts, uh, the fog start, starts lifting, they look better, but it's still a concern that their brain was fragile to begin with, to be under, um, you know, to have looked so terrible um, at, on, on, a, on a, at a period of time. For a period of time. Thank you for um, your response to that. One of the questions that came up is, you know, when we're talking about these different issues with teens, um, you know, where would you be directing the teens for help? Do you oftentimes, you know, begin, would you recommend individual therapy or group? And I know when Tamara and I are working in the high school, um, oftentimes it depends on the, you know, on the student. Um, but if, you know, we're talking about a student that has um, what, looks like a severe substance use disorder as well as mental health, like a co-occurring mental health disorder, what would some of your input be for our parents? I, I would say that it has to be a, a combination of, of um, in, you know, intervention at the individual level that you're seeing at the school, uh, but to really be effective, there has to be a family intervention as well. Um, because really the parents who once outside of school will, will set or determine the boundaries um, provide the, you know, the methods of accountability. Um, and so treating the adolescent in isolation without that um, is generally not going to be very effective. And then sometimes they're just what we call environmental interventions where, you know, we essentially make substances harder to get in the home. Um, and so that can have an, an impact. So if there's, you know, lots of alcohol in the home, in some cases, we have to ask parents uh, to lock it up or, you know, do what they need to do to make it difficult to get. So there are different levels of intervention. So the, the environment, changing things in the environment, the individual piece, uh, and then the family piece. Um, and to add to that, I think it really varies depending on the circumstances, the family history of substance use. We have had some individuals that come in and it's the first admission and we discover by virtue of the assessment that the concerns married a higher level of care or longer term supports, whereas there are another person that might be using consistently, but they may be dabbling. So a really important part of it is to just get a, a good assessment. It may start with, you know, with the pediatric assessment and then obtaining and following up with referrals to other mental health practitioners to help understand a little bit more um, the depth and the needs uh, as they pertain to each individual and family. Yeah, I, I mean, I would think about it of, you know, on a continuum. So there's use, abuse, and then there's what we might call addiction or dependence. Um, and then sometimes those things are not interchangeable. So there are some substances or some behaviors that are addictive in nature, but one doesn't develop dependence, uh, physiological dependence. So I really take a look at what is the relationship to that substance? You know, how involved, how um, involved is the adolescent with that substance, how much has it taken over his or her life? What are they willing to trade in exchange to preserve their relationship with their, with their substance? 
And so when we do assessments, we're really looking at where, uh, where someone may fall on that continuum. And one of the things I look at for, you know, people who are, um, you know, really abusing and moving towards, you know, serious trouble, I look for a couple of things. I look, is there continued use despite lots of adverse consequences? Um, and they, they keep using, and so that suggests they're not learning from, from mistakes. Uh, and the other I look at is, you know, have there been attempts, unsuccessful attempts to control the behavior? You know, promises to cut down on nicotine or promises to reduce uh, pot smoking, but not able to do it. And, and then if there's evidence, the, the third C is, you know, what I call cravings. Um, and if you have all those three, th three things together, continued use, um, attempts to control and cravings, you usually cross that line into, um, um, you know, with the adolescent or adult can't, can't control the behavior. It's now a question of, you know, not able to versus I want to. Yeah, I thought Angela was also asking something that's embedded in all our answers, which is what's the best treatment? How do you know what to do? And I think that critically calls for, you know, real evaluation, right? A real assessment of what goes on. Mm -hmm. This treatment should emerge from the differential diagnosis to use, you know, medical talk, right? We got to know mm -hmm. what we're up against. And what we're mostly up against in these situations, a very complex situation. Thank you. You actually answered the next question, which was, do you see um, more benefits in directing teens for individual therapy or group therapy? And it sounds like in all of your experiences, it really depends on that specific family and the case and the complexities mm -hmm. of um, that addiction. But again, for Dr. Um, Bartolomeo, um, the question for you is, what are your thoughts on the use of naltrexone and other medications for treatment of alcohol abuse in adolescents? Um, this is something that we're hearing more and more frequently, but do you have um, a perspective or have you seen um, certain cases where um, you feel like it could be beneficial or can you talk a little bit about that? I'm going to defer that one to Dr. T. Schwartz and um, Dr. Murata. Uh, they're the two physician, physicians of the three of us. Go ahead. Thank you. So, so I think in general, we are not using a lot of naltrexone in terms of some of the, um, you know, substance use disorders at the level that, that we see in this setting. Uh, in some communities, there is some usage and we have used naltrexone for other uh, addictive behaviors, including self-harm in, in different circumstances, it can come as a handy tool. And that's only one small tool in addition to all of the other um, therapeutic um, interventions. So again, not approved for kids uh, or teens specifically for, um, you know, for substance use, but it can be used occasionally. It's just not our uh, first two, um, you know, modality. Thank you so much. Um, one of the questions that just came through is, you know, and this really could be any of you that could answer this question. Um, when you're thinking about, you know, signs and symptoms, what are some things that parents could be looking for um, to, as signs of their, that their child is in trouble and that they may be abusing substances? What are some different things that they could be looking for um, at home? Liz, you want to start with that one? I think um, in terms of the home behaviors, any changes in behavior, sleep habits, et cetera, any changes in friend, friend group that it seems to be dramatically different from the previous peers, uh, any mood issues such as irritability, oversleeping, uh, undersleeping, um, et cetera. Um, you know, it, again, there's, there are a variety of physical signs in terms of, you know, redness of the, of, of, of the eyes and, you know, smells and other things like that, even though now with certain, you know, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, compounds to, you know, vaping marijuana, et cetera, it's a little bit harder to detect certain of the, you know, THC uh, as directly as you would if, you know, if a kid came smelling as much of, of mm -hmm. drugs. Uh, slurred uh, speech and changes in behavior, those would be some of the more significant um, things to, um, to consider. 
um, as well as changing is changes in spending habits. The kid working and they they don't have money for you know for food or other things that they might want to purchase. Where is that money going? Uh, unexplained uh, items in in the home as well could be a sign of of, of problem um, you know problem behavior as well as just just you know ge general loosening of some of the other you know household rules and responsibilities that could certainly be um, a problem, skipping school, et cetera. Yeah, I tend to look at if there's also um, a, a gradual or sudden restriction of activities that the teen had previously been involved with. Um, so suddenly they, you know, they were involved in, you know, band or chorus or a sport and suddenly their interest seems to be waning and, and you know, their lives are kind of getting smaller. Um, that's sometimes a result of having this, you know, develop, you know, this relationship with a substance and generally a corresponding peer group that is consuming more and more of their, um, you know, of their time and, you know, and, and treasure and their money. You know, what always strikes me is that some of them are obvious because the kid comes off track. <laughs> and then, then you have the kid who's going to the Ivy League school who's been running the drug racket at the local high school sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you, sometimes it's not obvious at 17, but at 20 it is. And, I, mm -hmm. you know, you see terrible things. And uh, I, it's, my analogy is it's like what happened when, you know, TVs became little computers and you had to go to your kids to find, turn out the TV on, you know, I think they're so good at, the kids are so much smarter at so much than we are that we can get fooled very easily. So it's like you have to have a high degree of suspicion, right, <laughs> of what goes on. <laughs> I get fooled all the time. And I think to talk about vaping, I think it's important for parents to be aware of what the devices um, look like, you know, they look like USBs or small pens and, or, and other things that, you know, computer mouses and things like that. So it's important to know, and if you find one of these, to have the conversations and be able to, um, you know, to see what it looks like. It's much, much harder to detect, which makes it even more attractive for kids and teens and just continues to uh, increase that, that feeling that it's not as dangerous as, as these things actually can be. So, Dr. Ortiz, um, one of the questions now that you're talking about vaping says, what um, would you recommend in terms of medication or nicotine replacement ther you know, therapeutics um, when dealing with teens and vaping? There are not a lot that are approved um, for, you know, I know for students under 18. So I, I know this is a question that we commonly get um, at the high school all the time from parents, and we oftentimes will refer them to physicians. So this is a great question, um, I think, for a lot of us. So uh, thank you. Yes, I think we, we traditionally use the nicotine patches uh, in addition uh, to the lozenges and the nicotine gums. Occasionally, if a kid is about 17 years old or, or so, um, the insurance companies and others might approve of label use of Chantix, Varicycline, and other um, you know, products like that. Um, so it is, it is possible to prescribe some of the uh, adult medications of label for teenagers as long as they are a little bit closer to 18 than not. Otherwise, really um, abstinence and again, uh, nicotine replacement uh, patches, gums, and lozenges tend to be uh, sufficiently helpful for, um, you know, for the gradual decrease. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So this question, I think I, I'd like to direct towards um, Dr. Murata. Um, we have uh, a parent that is sharing that, you know, they have a bright 16 year old who does well in school, um, but is hiding um, his or her marijuana use. And um, it says we have intervened early and got a therapist involved. What boundaries do we put in place other than limiting time alone away from our home and with friends? Um, they have a zero tolerance in their home, you know, can they drug test and, and how often would you suggest? Well, I mean, it's a 16 year old, so they still have a power, but it's going to be a power struggle, right? I mean, the culture is lined up against them. I mean, the family is going to be, you know, looked at as being 
too um, intrusive. But I mean, the kid has a therapist, the kid has a problem. The question is, is this sort of a quote normal situation or is there something going on that's gonna go very badly? And you need a handle on that, right? And, um, and that's why Frank is right about you need family therapy. You need to get into the family system of what's going on and how it's playing out. I mean, if somebody asks me how often you wanna test, you could say, well, you want to test every couple of weeks at least, right? But I don't think that's where the money's at with this kind of thing, um, because there's always ways of tricking us, and, and, and quite seriously so. I mean, we've had patients in hospital, patients in prison, right, using drugs and not getting caught. So you have to understand that parents don't have as much control as they may think they have. Uh, young people know a lot more than we do about you know, pharmacokinetics and, and, and masking. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so we have to look at this very carefully. And I think that it shouldn't, it's not something you can easily say on a screen in front of everybody. I think this is calls for a consultation. You know, they should speak to, you know, uh, one of the staff, you know, Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Bartomeu. I mean, they can give real advice on how to behave or other people in the community. Uh -huh. I, I, absolutely, I do agree. I think that just testing in a vacuum can create its own difficulties. There is an opportunity for testing at home for some individuals um, that, you know, but it still is within the context of a larger family support and, and um, to look at models that are more um, more supportive, more, more of a harm reduction model necessarily. Uh, that means that you really are basically contracting with the kid that if the urine is negative, then they have all of this privileges that they can participate and partake. And if they have a positive urine, it's not going to be like, okay, it's the end of the world and you're going immediately into treatment, but it merits a conversation with the therapist and with them and so forth. And I think that in the right therapeutic setting, um, a lot of therapists will, you know, will do some form of testing or will have uh, availability to do, to, you know, to do that through um, you know, through, through other medical providers. And I think that, that that strikes the balance and takes some of that responsibility away from your, from, from your child because you really wanna be able to, uh, to connect in a way that relationship and improving that relationship actually decreases some of the harm, longer term uh, harm more, more than anything, that educational piece and, and really supporting that. So I think that to get to the, that role of policing the child versus helping the child and supporting them and giving them education will be really desirable to move away from, from that. And the testing can sometimes be felt as intrusive. If somebody else can do that, and, and if that's needed, that's great. There is room and opportunity for parents to have to do the testing themselves, but that would be under very um, specific you know, uh, consultation and, and, and support to the, to the entire family system. What I liked and I heard in that question is that the family seems, you know, crystal clear about their values and has given um, an unambiguous uh, statement about use. And uh, many families don't do that. Many families will give more of an ambiguous um, response to use in terms of, you know, um, experimentation, that kind of thing. And I, I haven't met an adolescent yet who didn't take an ambiguous message about that as a green light to go ahead. So, um, you know, I like the fact and, and, you know, embedding it in the family values. So kids will get into, you know, fruitless, you know, debates about it's legal, it isn't legal, it should be legal, everyone's doing it. And I think just staying with, in our family, this is what we do and this is what we stand for. And in terms of testing, you know, I wouldn't use it as a first line intervention. Again, if there have been repeated instances in which family trust or parent trust has been violated, um, now you're moving into a place where the testing can be positioned as actually trying to, a way to rebuild trust as well as accountability. So what I'll, you know, I'll say to families is every time there's a negative screen, um, your son or daughter is making a deposit into the trust account. And usually by the time you get that, get to that point, you know, the trust account is either empty, you know, or overdrawn. And so framing it in terms of, you know, we need to rebuild trust. And this is one of the ways that we'll do this. 
um, and hold, you know, help them be accountable. Thank you. Um, one of our next questions, given the circumstances of COVID and our environment that we have forced to adjust to, um, what do you all suggest or have you had experience with virtual help? Um, have you had any positive experiences with virtual help for um, a student or um, anybody who might be misusing substances? And have you had any experiences with some of the apps for um, cessation? No, I was treated virtually for COVID. <laughs> and I, that was a good experience. I did well. Uh, and because I was sick, I had to treat my patients, you know, virtually for a while. And, and I was surprised by how well it seemed to work. Um, I'm sort of, in my old age, blown away by this part of it, you know, that there seems to be this ability to make these connections and see more clearly. Although there were some things that I do that I feel I cannot do well virtually, that I can't read someone's eyes or, you know, I mean, I, I'm an old style kind of physician, so I need to tap the reflexes and have a sense of the person physically. So there are things you can do and things that are not so easy to do, but that's just my own personal experience. And, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe the others have that different. Uh, this has been very hard. This is, for me, the virtual modality has been demanded a great deal of attention that on a level that was automatic because it was learned over a long period of time and had to be relearned, so it took more effort. But it's doable, uh, but it has problems in my mind. Um, for me, I think that um, the experiences that, that, I, that I hear and I know of is that kids are particularly responsive uh, and they don't struggle as much in terms of making a connection virtually because by nature they are involved frequently with face-to-face -face contact, I mean, contact with, you know, through a screen uh, to friends and others. So they're able to make the transition uh, fairly, um, you know, fairly robustly. Uh, also, it creates uh, a lot of more geographic flexibility. For example, we have an intensive outpatient program. And in the past, we could only refer within an hour's uh, distance because people couldn't drive. You know, the program is virtual now. So we have people traveling from, you know, from nearby areas and communities that they, they wouldn't be able to avail themselves for that, of that opportunity. So in some ways, uh, the geographic flexibility the fact that the teenagers are able to respond uh, to, to that medium uh, does have some advantages. Some of the disadvantages, especially when you're trying to have some of the group contact is, is that you miss out on some of the peer interaction and some of the lightness and some of the other things. So it feels a little bit more like some of the kids who are struggling with some of the you know, uh, virtual classrooms and so forth. And we have a, a lot of kids who have not responded to those supports who need in-person support. And, and those are the ones that have, you know, we have to connect them with, um, you know, with, uh, you know, face-to-face -face support. So not everybody responds in the same way. And there are many kids that are actually taking advantage of that. Also because of the distim uh, decreased stigma that, you know, the visits um, have, you don't have to necessarily go to an office or go through a bigger procedure. It feels a little bit more less intimidating for, for, for teens. So that, that's one of the other um, advantages. Thank you so much. Um, that's very helpful because uh, I know how challenging it's been being in the school. Um, mm -hmm. Just learning how, you know, I like how you said, you know, the things that were so natural as a counselor to be able to read someone's face expression now with a mask is you're looking at all the different uh, body language and everything that you could imagine to try to read eyes more than anything and expressions underneath. Um, you know, one of the questions that also came up that was sent in prior um, was, you know, a parent had asked, what do you do if you discover that your 16 year old um, has smoked marijuana and eaten edibles on more than one occasion and really enjoys it? You know, what are, what are some things that you could help this parent um, with, with what they could say to their child? I know oftentimes right now, because of the society's current perspective, um, 
you know, a lot of the adolescents don't believe there's a lot of risk involved with THC use or marijuana, you know, marijuana use. So it would be great, you know, to hear um, from you guys what your thoughts are. In an election year, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm, I was actually at Woodstock. I always tell people it's not a joke, you know, and I, I was at Berkeley in the summer of love. And so I grew up with a very different ideology. So it makes perfect sense that if you're a teenager, you're 16 year old, you know, smoked or at an edible, that it would be a pleasurable experience because, you know, that's the way the vast majority of us are wired to find that pleasurable. So it's hard to imagine the dangers that will emerge over time especially when it's not everybody, right? It's, and it may be the one in nine that things get very bad for. So it, it's a tricky bit of business how to negotiate. And I think what Frank said about the family values, they're very critical, right? Uh, I mean, because the values of the society, especially liberal Northeast society are such that it's, totally acceptable behavior and it's odd to be opposed to it, right? It's really odd to take a stance um, against uh, drug use, you know, especially what's looked at as being relatively benign drug use. So a family has to say, what are our values? What, again, as he said, what do we stand for and what, how do we want this to go in our family? And I also think it helps for families to get together. You know, I, I really think that groups of mothers and fathers talking about these things is really important and that they need input from school personnel, from teachers and from others, right? And I think they need access to other information to help them do it because I rarely see information in the general press about the dangers of, of marijuana, which is interesting to me, right? You see much more information about the dangers of cigarette smoking at least as I read it, than marijuana use. Um, and I think it should be a general conversation. And again, that comes from my clinical experience, but I mean, guys, how, you know, in our own experience, like we have to go to lectures, you know, we have doctors have to go to school for the rest of their lives, which is a good thing. I mean, how often have we gone to a, a grand rounds or a required lecture on the danger of marijuana? Right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of times, <laughs> right? But on alcohol, all the time in comparison, right? And I mean, we're required to monitor people with cigarette smoking. That's almost a requirement of everybody, whether you're, you're a retinal surgeon or a, or a psychiatrist. It's like, we, we can't discharge patients without having, you know, there's things we have to fill out and we have to attest that we've discuss these things, right? That um, we're, not, we're not mandated to take so seriously uh, other things. So um, it's not strange to me that the general culture, we're a reflection of the general culture's values. Um, yeah, and remember, you know, it's- money is, you know? Sorry, Rocky. Yeah. It's the parents have the earliest influence on kids' relationships or attitudes towards substances. So that in terms of nicotine, alcohol, other drugs. And so that's being shaped very early, not by what we say, but by what we do. And certainly with alcohol use, it has become such an ingrained part of our culture. It's an, now kids regard it as an entitlement. I'm entitled to drink and you know, get wasted uh, because that's what we do in this culture. And that's what I'm entitled to do at college. So pushing against that, uh, is very challenging because it's so ingrained into, uh, you know, our mores. And that's taught very early. You know, growing up, you know, my father's been a season ticket holder for the Patriots for 50 years. And when I was a kid, he and his friends would drag their sons to the football games. And what did I see when they were tailgating? I saw lots of men, uh, also women, consume large amounts of alcohol. And so what are the message that I get that I get about what men do to do together when they get together? 
right? That was a that was that was something that was communicated to me non-verbally. And it took me generations to really appreciate, you know, that men can get together and it doesn't have to involve a beer or a substance. So that's being shaped very, very early. And, you know, kids see us when, um, you know, you come home from work and have a cocktail, right? That's saying something, you know, kids are wondering why do, when you go to weddings, everyone's drinking, um, you know, that's saying something. And those are the kinds of discussions that kind of, you know, you know, as Rocky said, it makes sense that they want to use a substance that makes them feel good. And, you know, there has to be sort of a broader dialogue about this. Thank you. Um, just being mindful of the time before we wrap up, yeah. you did answer um, a little bit of this question. Um, what, as parents, what kind of behavior should we be concerned to respect of um, leading a good example for our young ones, adolescent model good and bad behaviors. Should we be concerned about keeping our drinking in check or how do we balance um, making it appropriate but still educating our students that um, that's not something that we want them to be involved in? And I think that you all mentioned it again, it goes back to values and having those conversations and building relationships um, and having the student understand and have um, a perception of harm before they wanna argue about the laws. So I definitely see that in the middle school um, mm -hmm. as well, just focusing on good decision-making skills so that they have the tools to um, make the right choice. So can any of you speak to how parents if they should monitor their behavior or how to go about that? I mean, the research is, is clear that, you know, um, kids who binge drink um, uh, tends to have a parent who uh, is also binge drinking or is more likely to binge drink if they see a parent doing that. So again, the parent may not regard it as binge drinking, but if you think about, um, you know, um, five drinks in a two period, two hour period of time, it also depends on what you're drinking. Um, and so, you know, uh, wine tends to have a greater, um, you know, alcohol content than, than certain beer. So they're, they're, if they're watching, you know, parent consume, you know, many glasses of wine at dinner, that's, that's, that's again, communicating how people drink. So I, I think paying attention to that is enormously important. And in some cases, you know, we have to we have to go back and acknowledge when we made mistakes. You know, we've had we've had kids. I've worked with kids whose parents have, in some ways, given them the green light to experiment, and then things got very bad, and then they started having you know fruitless debates about how much is too much. And in some of those cases, I think the parents had to go back and say, "I made a mistake. I gave you some very mixed messages about about using." And, you know, I'm sure that confused you. You know, we, we, we had a kid recently at the hospital who, you know, in response to her heavy substance use, the father would say, oh, I did what you did, but many times over. And, you know, she began to see her father as a potential um, uh, risk factor in her, in her relapsing. Um, because in some ways he was, he wasn't acknowledging or giving the reality of what, what she was doing, but actually was saying, well, that was nothing compared to what I did. He loves his daughter, but gave her some very confusing and dangerous messages. Thank you. In addition to, go, to addressing the confusing or problematic messages, I think, and, and setting a good um, example, I think it's really important to engage the, the teens and individuals in the dialogue and discussion that does not seem um, to be too directive. So it really is about asking uh, questions, uh, not just telling them what to do, but trying to understand what kind of pressures the kids are facing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what are some of the, the things that the peers are doing, you know, asking questions, you know, is, is there, are there a lot of kids vaping in your school? Um, how are you feeling about uh, vaping if you see somebody vape and eventually teaching them the language so that they have a plan. So if they encounter these things, how can they avoid them? How can they really manage without looking, you know, silly or, or, or foolish or, or missing out on some of the social, um, you know, uh, cachet that goes with you know, with, with doing this, these substances nowadays. So it, it becomes mm -hmm. 
part of the process, part of the ongoing conversations. And the more that parents can learn, um, you know, the about the you know, the use and the tools and what's going on around uh, their, you know, their neighborhoods, what happens when they're visiting another friend's house and all of that, the more they can help support their child specifically to their situation while upholding their own family, um, you know, values when it comes to what is healthy, what is safe um, and what, what is appropriate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very difficult when we're anxious about our children to approach them with curiosity rather than judgment. And approaching them with curiosity and exploring what would it mean for you if you didn't use substances in your school? Often it comes with significant social costs. And often the highest, um, the kids with high social status are, are heavy partiers. And being able to empathize with them because we all have a need to belong for adolescents is even more intense. So they're often caught between these competing um, drives, if you will. One hand, I need to co connect and belong, but then how do I also adhere to the values or the beliefs my parents are putting out for me? It's a very difficult uh, dilemma. And I think approaching that with empathy and appreciating, you know, what would happen, again, if you go to the party and you're the only kid who's not using, what would that be like? And I've heard other kids tell me, I won't get invited to the parties. Okay, so now there's gonna be a social cost associated with it. And how are we gonna deal with that? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, students um, really appreciate the honesty and not just saying no, because I said so, but mm -hmm. having a further understanding of why so that they can make those decisions and feel confident when you know, they're approached in a situation that's not safe. So mm -hmm. awesome, thank just, you. Just to add to that as, as one of my final comment, comment is to recognize that, you know, the, the brakes, the impulsivity part of the brain and the ability to just pump the brakes is not there yet for, you know, mm -hmm. for most individuals until their early to mid twenties. So to understand the context of, you know, it is not as easy as telling somebody, don't do this. I think that the, 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 the temptation in the moment is going to be much more significant. So the fight is, is going to be, uh, you know, we have to be cogn cognizant of that in our uh, supportive and educational efforts. I mean, I feel so strongly in agreement with everybody, but also this idea that the school is a central place in this to setting, you know, it's trying to set a different set of values because we're just occasional, you know, advisors or viewers of this. And also what I saw with my own children, that there were other people in the community took on the parental role in a way that we didn't understand that, um, you know, that we were odd parents. And, but it, it, our children became identified with other people's parents. And there's some pretty wild behaviors going on in Fairfield County. And, in Westchester County. And I think that has to be addressed on some level at some point. Mm -hmm. I'm actually in Charleston, South Carolina on vacation and I got to head off again. It was a great <laughs> pleasure. Thank you for having me. Take care. Bye. Of Thank, Bye, you so Thank you so much, Dr. Murata. Thank Enjoy. you. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Thank you for everything that you have all mentioned tonight. I think it's so important. Um, I think parents oftentimes can feel so alone dealing with each mm -hmm. one of their children's and feel like their situation is so unique. Um, and it is to, it is very unique to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just so much appreciate, you know, all of your input and everything that, um, that you guys have shared tonight. And I think even, you know, being professionals in the school, we usually are the first line of intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, you know, always trying to figure out what's the best way um, to intervene with this family and help them in the moment, you know, with some of the questions that they've been asking tonight. Um, we do have, you know, two final questions um, that we were hoping to get to. Um, one is, uh, you know, it's about, um, it's for, you know, families, there's a psychiatrist that um, is in private practice that often encounters early substance abuse in patients, particularly with ADHD. And um, first question is, how do you balance the need of ADHD with the needs to treat the substance issues? And then the second question is, 
How do you work with families to treat any underlying codependency family structures that can also be a large part of reinforcing part of the substance issues? So on the question of uh, stimulants, the studies have shown that um, when a person has ADHD and they enter the, enter the teenage years, uh, if they're not properly treated, that they're at a higher risk of um, additional substance use. And it's typically not addiction to the, the stimulants themselves. A lot of the times the stimulants help to, you know, to kind of like help normalize and decrease some of the, um, you know, hyperactivity, impulsivity. So not having those things, not having the, for example, the stimulant medication to treat hyperactivity, impulsivity has shown uh, that the risk of substance use is higher. And when kids are properly treated, it's not that their risk goes low, but at least it's, it's even, it levels the playing field with other kids that do not have attentional issues. So I think it is important to balance it out. And if there's concerns that the kid might be diverting the drug, meaning like util, utilizing their medication to sell it or give it to other kids, obviously that needs to be addressed on a, on, on a very careful basis. Um, assessing there are occasional kids that do have ADHD that will want to abuse their own um, stimulant medication that is rare and it still merits uh, limiting the amount of medication, making sure that they are taking it consistently sometimes, drug testing them, but reversely, not to find that they have other substances, but to make sure that they're taking the medication as, as prescribed. So there are ways to manage that. And I think that on a general, on a general sense, it's important to, to treat more often than not and to have agreements with the uh, adolescent patients in, in terms of having conversations that if you suspect that the medication is being diverted or misused, then they're not going to get that medication. And for the most kids, they want to do well in school, and that's the, the one that helps them the most. And thinking about switching to non-stimulant medications, which might be less effective, you know, it's less of a, it, it, it's not worth it. So they will, you know, very often respect the, those agreements that they have made with you as a, as a treater or provider. Um, and... Um, the second question, I don't, I don't recall, but I'll but. take a stab at that one. <laughs> okay. I think it was um, regarding uh, codependent dynamics and, and families, you know, codependency and, you know, what we might call enabling, you know, I really regard as misplaced love. And what I mean by that is this, we are hardwired as human beings and as parents that when we see our child struggling or suffering, that we're going to move in and protect them. We are hardwired to do that. What can happen with a substance use issue is that the parent keeps doing that in such a way that it allows the, um, the person to be able to underfunction. So they develop what we call an overfunctioning, underfunctioning relationship. So, and it becomes a dynamic so that the more you overfunction, it allows the, the child to continue to underfunction or continue to use the substance. Um, so again, it comes out of a place of love initially. And again, at a very deep, um, deep level. And, um, you know, being able to stop that uh, and see that actually what you're doing is contributing to the problem or allowing continued use um, takes a lot of work and effort on the part of a parent because you have to use your, you know, your, your cognition to pull back your heart because the heart is going to want to rescue. And it's a very difficult dilemma uh, for parents. Thank you. Um, and I think this is a perfect question to wrap up. Um, what, at the end of this discussion, what is the most important takeaway for parents and kids who might be listening to this Zoom call? What is the most important um, takeaway that you have to share with us? I think in terms of substances that it's important to really know, know the risks, to understand that the brain is developing and you really uh, wouldn't put things in your body, you know, wouldn't eat things or put things in your body if you don't know what's, what's in there. Uh, and it's the same thing with, you know, substances, alcohol and other things that, that, that really can impact, um, you know, a lot of things down the line. And that the most preventive um, strategy is education and relationships. And if you build on those, those are the most important uh, things to, you know, to consider. 
Yeah, to, to build on, on what Liz said, you know, there's an expression that the opposite of uh, addiction is not sobriety, it's connection and relationships. And so this idea that I talked about where someone is developing a relationship with a substance or a behavior and that beginning to drive a wedge in between people and children and parents. So paying attention to that connection, that also means for parents, you know, we're often under enormous stress um, and also feel particularly alone and isolated with this. And I think to the extent that parents can kind of get, also get together, connect, have a, um, a group that you feel sustained by, um, um, you know, is enhancing and can focus on helping you to maintain that connection, that relationship, so that um, a substitute like a, like a substance uh, doesn't interfere with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you know, as we're coming to um, conclude for the evening, I just think that um, everything that the doctors have shared with us tonight um, is just so helpful. I think it's probably helped Tamara and I also um, in the work that we're going to be able to do moving forward um, with our, you know, the teens that we intervene with this year. Um, you know, one of the things that I think about all the time and to say to parents also is just to remember that you're not alone, even oftentimes you can feel like that mm -hmm. um, when you're dealing with your child and that you have um, local resources. We have Silver Hill, which is an amazing hospital. I've had a lot of um, students that have attended um, and been in part of their programs in patient and out. Um, and they're really great at um, treating our students and follow through and, and they've been so helpful to so many of our families. Um, and, you know, I also you want to say that um, Tamara and I are, are available to you also. Um, oftentimes parents don't know where to turn and it's important for you to know that the schools do have mm. confidential um, services um, to be able to help walk you through some of the experiences that you may come up against. Um, so we just want to thank our panelists um, for doing an amazing job um, tonight. Mm. And as Tamara mentioned, um, this is recorded. So if um, you feel like there was something that you missed or um, any questions that you would like for us to forward um, to the doctors, we can definitely do that and have some questions answered. And um, this um, will be available on um, a link to YouTube. So if you have any friends that you think could really benefit from hearing tonight's discussion, um, please pass that along. And that will be emailed to you um, within the next uh, day or so. Thank, Thank you so you much so for much. having us. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank you, everyone, for the questions in the chat. This was a really good conversation. And thank you to everybody for participating. This was really great. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good night, thank everybody. Thank you so much.